Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! He will begin this morning with an examination of, of something that's been bothering me for years now, as, as you'll know if you're kind enough to listen on a regular basis. It, it's just this curious accommodation of untruths. Uh, politicians all tell lies. That's a common refrain, a common phrase. But there's a scale, isn't there, of deception and dishonesty. There is a denial of what is right in front of our very eyes. And it is now being undertaken on a daily basis by the President of the United States of America. And yesterday he did it here, while standing beside our Prime Minister and describing events outside the building they were in in the most dishonest and deceitful of terms. And I, and I just want to try, hopefully, without necessarily engaging in any uh, kind of ding-dong, I want to try and work out why. I just want to know how he gets away with it. I, I, I'm intrigued. I suspect for people that are uh, attracted to Donald Trump's brand of politics, rhetoric, call it what you will, then part of the way you can excuse it is by pointing out that you don't trust any politicians. But isn't that the mother of all two wrongs make a right arguments? Speaking of two wrongs making a right, PMQs today will be conducted by, wait for it, David Liddington and Rebecca Long-Bailey, with their more senior colleagues being um, quite rightly drawn to the D-Day celebration, celebrations, commemorations down in Portsmouth. Uh, the 75th anniversary of D-Day tomorrow, of course, June the 6th. Today marks the commemoration of the assembly of the troops that would lead that invasion into Normandy. Um, we'll just take advisement on whether or not we invite tales of our, our own family's involvement today or, or tomorrow on that, because I'm, I'm really drawn to another element to emerge from that press conference with Donald Trump and Theresa May yesterday, which is, which is the health service. And I, he's already uh, done what he always does and said the opposite of what he said yesterday. That's, that's what fake news rhetoric is designed to do, to, to render the notion of a fact or an objective truth redundant. If I say on a Tuesday that black is black and then on a Wednesday that black is white, I, I can be held to nothing. So yesterday the NHS is on the table during any putative trade talks between Britain and America, a position that had already, of course, been described by the American ambassador Woody Johnson. And um, then today in an interview with Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain, it's off the table again. So what are you supposed to believe? That is the only thing I can come close to describing as a classic Trump tactic, to say black is black and black is white in the space of 24 hours so that you can be held to nothing. Um, nobody knows what the heck is going on but neither can you ever really be held to account because you've already said both things. I suppose you'd have to start by asking when was he lying, when he said it was on the table or when he said it wasn't on the table. And that is very much where we are now. And, and it's very, very strange. Because that old adage about journalism is, is, is very, very attractive. It's certainly what I thought our job was in this business, somewhat naively, many, many moons ago, when I swapped my tape measure, my menswear tape measure for a, for a notebook and a, and a, I'd like to say a computer, but even computers weren't completely commonplace when I started on Fleet Street. The, 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 the idea was that if, if someone tells you it's raining and someone says it isn't, we stick our head out of the window and find out. It's what we do. Thank you to Catherine, who reminds me that in the context of English weather, you can move from rain to sunshine in the space of a nanosecond, which is, as she points out, a fairly neat description of Donald Trump's uh, posturing and pivoting. But that, that's what I want to know. And I don't know if we're going to be able to do it in a way that doesn't offend Donald Trump's supporters. I still don't really know what that means, I'll be honest with you. But... We can all agree that there were protests against his presence here in London yesterday. We can disagree about how many were there. I don't know. I didn't count. Uh, I think I've seen 75,000 as an official figure. There were way more than that last time. If it was half of that, you could still describe it as tens of thousands of people. There were a handful of people, I think, it, it, to be kind, in the hundreds, who perhaps were there to approve of Donald Trump and, and to cheer him. And yet he stood in front of the world's cameras... And I think this is just a statement of fact. If you've already got a problem with that description of this as a statement of fact, I really want to talk to you today. I want to kind of learn from you about how you've ended up where you are. So he stood in front of the world's cameras, standing next to the British Prime Minister, and described reports of protests. I did say, at the very least, that Trafalgar Square was full. Can, can we say that? I was in a plane at the time, flying back from Greece, but he, he described the protests as fake news. I mean, it, it is literally standing in the pouring rain claiming that it's dry. 
And I don't know whether it's because I've had a few days off and I, I sort of return to the fray somewhat refreshed, but I can't quite get my head around how we've ended up here. Can you? I, I, I know that politicians have a fragile relationship with the truth. I know, for example, that the dossier upon which Tony Blair took us to war in Iraq, in, in, in retrospect, was profoundly flawed and, and arguably deeply deceitful. I, I know that politicians make promises that they don't keep. I know that manifestos are rarely worth the paper that they're written on. But I feel there's a broad framework which recognises whether it's night or day, whether it's wet or dry, whether it's hot or cold. And that is the thing that Donald Trump has successfully dismantled. And having seen him successfully dismantle it, the Conservative leadership campaign seems to suggest at this point that many British politicians are, are going to behave similarly. Some of these candidates for the Conservative leadership are, are, are coming out with things that are utterly beyond the pale and completely untenable and untrue. But they've, I presume, sort of seen that it works. Every generation every other generation learns this lesson. It's why books like 1984 exist. It's why dystopian fiction exists. Every other generation or, or you know, every generation but two learns that if the lie is big enough and you repeat it often enough, as I think Joseph Goebbels explained, then it will hold. It will take root. And I don't know where you sit on this phenomenon, but I think we have to acknowledge that there is a, a, a big split. There are an awful lot of people who can't all be crackers or, or even unpleasant, but there are an awful lot of people who seem to like being lied to. And I would like to work out why today. Ideally, with contributions from people who, who are in that category, but I can't quite see how that works because you're not going to ring me up and say, I like being lied to. You're going to try perhaps to claim that you're not being lied to. Who, who could realistically put their hand on a Bible or, or, or whatever um, uh, sort of exemplar of probity and integrity you prefer, who could put their hand on their heart and say there weren't any protests against Donald Trump in London yesterday, there were thousands of people cheering for him? Because that's what the man claimed. And what should Theresa May have done at that point, I wonder? I can't help thinking that you almost want a Hugh Grant moment. Is it Love Actually when he turns on? Is it an American president? I haven't seen the film for ages, but isn't there, isn't there a Hugh Grant film where he, he publicly rebukes a major foreign leader in a way that is utterly at odds with protocol and precedent and tradition? But which, I mean, I, I knew this was going to happen because I was thinking about it a lot on holiday. I, I can't... I, I, as soon as I start trying to get the words out, I can't believe what we've become. How, how far and how fast we have fallen as a democracy on both sides of the Atlantic. Again, I, I don't necessarily want to start by scrapping with people who like Donald Trump. I want to talk about the fact that he said something yesterday in front of the world's television cameras while standing next to the British Prime Minister that is... I mean, completely untrue, demonstrably untrue. And then, and then he takes to Twitter, as is his want, to do it again. I, how has this happened? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. I'm interested in almost any answer you might have to this question because I, I don't know, and I do this stuff for a living. If someone tells you it's raining, and someone else tells you that it's not, our job is not not to offer equal weight to both positions. Our job is to stick our head out of the window and find out. So if you stuck your head out of the window yesterday, you would have seen tens of thousands of people, for good or for ill, I don't even need you to take a side on whether there should have been protests at this point. I, I obviously find Donald Trump chilling and, and, and repellent in many, many ways. But he's here to commemorate men and women who died. Um, in the service of their country, and of course to protect, among many other things, a free media, a free press, something else that he seems to despise, but, but, but we must commemorate and properly respect the memory of men and women who died to allow people like you and me to have conversations like this. So I don't, I don't need to even establish that before we talk about how we've ended up in a place where the most powerful man on the planet can stand on, on hallowed turf, as it were, 
You know, this is the very heart of the British Constitution, the British nation, British tradition. He can stand there next to our Prime Minister. Kind of elected as well, don't forget, Theresa May. The British Prime Minister in front of the world's television cameras and just tell a lie. It's 10 13. Phone lines are open. Be quick, though. 0345 6060 And I would really like to talk to you, if you don't mind, if you would loosely accept that you're one of the people I, I have, at this point, little choice but to describe as, I like being lied to. I enjoy being lied to. Oddly, I asked Roger Stone about this. That sounds like I'm about to play a clip, doesn't it? It's like one of those radio tropes. Like, Oddly, I spoke earlier, but I asked Roger Stone about this a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago. No, a couple of years ago, after, after Trump got in. Because I just wanted to know whether Donald Trump believes on some level what he says. Whether he's got that, is it a psychological condition whereby he, he actually persuades himself that it's true? So Roger Stone, a, a trickster, and, and, and a shyster of old. I think he was responsible for claiming, wasn't he, that, that Marco Rubio's dad had something to do with the, with the murder of, of, of JFK. I mean, the, the man is, is, is a, a master of the dark arts. And I, I said to him, I, I see you on a stage, Mr Stone, and as you've just pulled off a, a great conjuring trick or a great con, I see you sort of turning to the, to the balcony where your friends are sitting and winking, sort of acknowledging that you've pulled off a big con. I don't know that Donald Trump does that, oddly. I, I, I think somewhere in Donald Trump's head, he believes that there were thousands of people cheering for him on the streets of London yesterday. And then for the millionth time, we remind ourselves of those words towards the end of 1984, <laughs> where it says, um, the party told you to... Not, not to trust the evidence of your own eyes and ears. It was the party's final, most terrifying command. We're there, aren't we? I mean, reassure me, comfort me, help me. We're there. We, we are now a country where the President of the United States of America can tell us not to trust the evidence of our own eyes and ears, but to trust instead the words that come out of his mouth. There were tens of thousands of people protesting his presence in London yesterday. He said there weren't. He said there were thousands of people cheering him. How has it come to this? Well, Donald Trump has been deploying his well-known brand of diplomacy in London, heaping praise on his friends and attacking his detractors. He took time today to see Nigel Farage and to speak to Boris Johnson. He branded Jeremy Corbyn a negative force whose invitation to meet him he had turned down. He lavished praise on the UK and Theresa May, but the outgoing president, uh, prime minister rather, had to endure some embarrassing questions and answers at their joint press conference. And as thousands of anti-Trump protesters were mostly kept away from the president, he said it was all fake news. He'd seen flag-waving supporters. And tonight he's hosting a banquet at the ambassador's residence. It's all been a bit keeping up with the Trumps, as our political editor Gary Gibbon reports. President Trump wasn't visiting the Queen today, just using her gardens at Buckingham Palace as a helicopter park and ride. His motorcade then took him off towards Westminster. He later spoke of seeing thousands of well-wishers. The mall, though, looked empty except for police. Many roads shut down for his convoy. Most protesters kept well away. As he turned into Downing Street, one supporter waved a stars and stripes. Coming over today, there were thousands of people cheering. And then I heard that there were protests. I said, where are the protests? I don't see any protests. I did see a small protest today when I came, very small. So a lot of it is fake news, I hate to say. Just around the corner from Downing Street, tens of thousands listened to the Labour leader. Jeremy Corbyn boycotted the state banquet for President Trump last night and said the state visit should never have been allowed. And by our demonstration here today, we've shown just how determined we, all of us, are to achieve that better place and that better world. Thank you for being here today for peace, for justice and disarmament. It was there. It was happening. It was clear. It was in front of our eyes. And then Donald Trump just said it wasn't. And I don't know that we know how to cope with that level of deceit or deception. How has it come to this? How have we ended up here in, in just, what, three years? Gone from a, 
a country, a society that was flawed, far from perfect, but which at least had a vague subscription to the notion of objective truth. If a politician stood up in the middle of a rainstorm and said the sun is shining, we would all, wouldn't we, have reacted with a similar degree of dismissal and derision? But not anymore. And I want to know why. Why you think it is. Russell is in Catford to kick us off. Russell, what do you reckon? Yeah, good morning, James. Hello, uh, I'm going to blame you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Make a list. Make you, a list, you Russell. Lot. You and your lot. Yes. It's the reporting. A big part of it. It's not the only thing, but a big part of it is the reporting. When you report opinion as fact, people believe it as fact. And people are... They're too frightened to call people out. You won't see a front-page headline, Trump the liar. No. Uh, 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 people have, uh, whether it's because it's the right wing press, whether it's because um, of, of, of lack of education for people, but a big part of it is opinion being. But that's not. Is that new? Has that you said as if? No, it's uh, not new. This is. Uh, that's what going, I mean. I've, so I've we've never. We've, opinion uh, for the last twenty years. But it, twenty years ago, this surely wouldn't have happened. If if if. I mean, who was in charge in America 20 years ago? Was it George Bush Sr.? If, uh, if, yeah, whoever, I, I mean, for, check the calendar. But if George Bush Sr. stood up in London on a state visit and said, there are thousands of people outside cheering me, and we all knew there were tens of thousands of people outside protesting against his very right. presence in our capital, then I think James, we would have... It's, it's what you can get away with. Uh, yeah. Trump is a master of manipulation. Hey, when, he, when he was on The Apprentice, they, 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 they push it a little bit, don't they? What can we get away with? What can we yes. get away with? Yes. And he bought what he could get away with into politics. What can I get away with? We got away with it with uh, whatever the millions of viewers in America. So we can get away with it with the, uh, the voting public. And, and it's just little by little. And then when and you blame it on me... No one calls we... him out. No one calls him out. No one... Um, Why not, Russell? Pardon? Why don't they call it out? <laughs> well, I'm not a conspiracist. Uh, but... but. I'm, beginning think, <laughs> I'm beginning to think yes. that there is a conspiracy because it is so bad. Yes. Uh, everything, you know, from the politicians, from uh, the, 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 the papers that are reporting, from the news that we're hearing... Um, when, when someone can... But the BBC, let's bring the BBC into it at this point, because I think well, I, like I, the BBC. I, I think your conspiracy works uh, up, to, up to the point, up to and including the people who own the newspapers. So if you looked at who got to ask Donald Trump questions yesterday, it was Sky News, which Rupert Murdoch owned until very recently, and The Times, which Rupert Murdoch still owns. If you look yeah. at who got interviews with Donald Trump at the weekend, it was The Sunday Times, which Rupert Murdoch owns, and it was The Sun, which Rupert Murdoch owns. And then you have the interview interview that Piers Morgan secured for Good Morning Britain this morning, which is because of his appearances on The Apprenticeship and his friendship with, with Donald Trump. And of course, Piers himself has, has worked for Rupert Murdoch in the past. Uh, yeah, right. so, so you've got that. Then you've got the Barclay Brothers, who own the Daily Telegraph, and who uh -huh. also seem to amplify this sort of stuff. The Express, under the last ownership, did it. The Mail has, has kind of, under the last editor, it, it contributed hugely. But why don't the BBC, in your view, have a headline today that says Donald Trump lied? They say Donald the Trump claimed, or Donald Trump said, or Donald Trump insisted. It doesn't just say Donald Trump lied. I think the BBC are under attack. They're under attack from uh, outside agencies that, that, that really want to take over the BBC. I'll yeah. see the BBC diminished, but BBC is worldwide, James. You know, it's got such a big voice. You're not answering today, my question. Not You're not answering my question. Why, why don't they just have a headline today, or on the news, on the 10 last night, saying Donald Trump lied today? Because they would be absolutely bashed by by those people that you've just mentioned oh, that own the press. Yeah. The, the, the questions will be asked in Parliament about it. Because, um, accused of disrespecting him, and then really cynical people would say you were disrespecting the the, the, the D-Day veterans or the D-Day dead. You'd be accused of that. There'd be this astonishing sort of conflation and confection of claim that would be designed to describe the people calling him a liar as being the villains of the piece, even while they were right. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening, isn't it? I think it probably is, Russell. We, we, we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes now. John. And how do we stop it, briefly? <laughs> Bring on the revolution, brother. <laughs> <laughs> 10 24, still got his sense of humour. God knows you need one. Paul's in Crouch Hand. Paul, what do you think? James, I, I don't think it's a cut and dried issue. No, clearly. And I think um, it, it's not a simple kind of black and white that, you know, we should be doing this, this is why it happened. I think you've actually got to put a lot of this in context going back probably since the Second World War and the breakdown of the political consensus between the two main parties. From a political history point of view, uh, su subsequent generations of politicians realised that they could lie, 
get away with it and on, on this scale all of this. on this scale yes 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 for example for, for example hang on hang on yes, I'm, I'm hanging this is the fact that the first pass play system which has always been with us is fantastically unaccountable. Yeah, I, I'm so going to just press just pause. I, I mean, you can say hang on, hang on, hang on as much as you want. I, I'm, I'm looking at a man yesterday claiming it was raining when the sun was shining, to, yeah. to coin a phrase. Yeah. And I, I want to know yeah. why that's happened. I don't want to talk about electoral systems first past the post. I, I want to talk about the failure of journalism. Because it wouldn't make any difference. That's the, that's the bottom line. If the BBC put out a headline saying Trump is a liar people would self-select what they want to read and what they want to hear okay. and reaffirm their own opinion anyway. And that's why he I was is, a little previous in dismissing your broader analysis of it because you were describing to us how the playing field had changed while I'm still talking correct. about the tactics being employed by the correct. players. Okay. So if something happens tomorrow where he lies again yes. and the BBC puts out a headline saying, God, he's, done it. he's got to done it again, he's lied again, People will read that, whether it's on the website or listen to it on the news or whatever, and they will self-hear or self-read what already confirms their political opinions. And very, so very briefly, them, very, very briefly, how, yeah, sorry, how, sorry. how is that attributable to the first-past-the-post electoral system? Oh, uh, I, I haven't got long enough to do with this. <laughs> you need to get your own show, <laughs> Paul. A busy guy, I'm a busy guy, but the point is that we've been sitting away at the edifice of, of morality for about 40 or 50 years, and the, pub, the British public and the American public in particular, the, the basically the Western capitalist democracies, okay. are so politically exhausted that they just don't see a way I, out. I of have a feeling... That will, listen, yeah. will listen to anybody who shouts loud enough. What, what's the point in resisting it? It's going to happen anyway. And uh, this phrase I, I, I like, footballification, you've picked your side you'll furiously defend them whatever they do because they're your side. Again, I was thinking about that a bit on holiday. Um, I, I think I might write a little bit about footballification. And it, and it occurred to me, if I criticise Donald Trump for lying, people that like Donald Trump for, for, for whatever reason, for example, when he elected to abuse on a very personal level our mayor, the, the, the mayor of London, um, oddly people who claim that foreign politicians shouldn't meddle in our business decided that they were going to side with Donald Trump when he attacked the elected mayor of the English capital. And you sort of find yourself, well, how does that work? I thought they were patriots. I thought they were um, uh, obsessed with foreign politicians meddling in our business. And, and Sadiq Khan, of course, had called out Donald Trump's record and its, its flirtations, to be kind, with very, very far-right traditions and tropes. So very, two very, very different things, a, a personal attack versus political criticism. But again, it, it was turned into two sides. If you criticise Trump, you must somehow be on Sadiq Khan's side. I think what we need to do is concentrate now on being on the side of the rules that both teams have to play by. I have no team. I'm here to make sure the referee can do his job. No one's doing that at the moment in the British media. Uh, I think that's probably important. Speaking of media, President Trump's um, track record of, of false or misleading claims has powered through the 10,000 mark. Um, this is, of course, followed by the Washington Post. And that's why he has to get fake news into the bloodstream, because he has told over 10,000 falsehoods. How can you possibly sustain support when you've lied to your voters over 10,000 times? Answer, redefine lies, redefine facts, alternative facts, lies. But why did he, why did he get away with it here? I, I'm not going to coin the phrase, I, I thought we were better than this. Well, I wouldn't be coining it, I'd just be employing it. I, I don't know that I do think that anymore. We're clearly not better than this. You look at what passed for journalism when Paul Dacre was editor of the Daily Mail and, and what passes for journalism now when it comes to reporting utter nonsense about the European Union. We're clearly not better than this in many ways. But I don't believe that a British politician... Oh, well, that's the question, isn't it? Could, could a Boris Johnson or someone similar to that stand up in public and and lie at a press conference about events going on literally outside the building he was in. It's not quite the same as Farage lying about assassination attempts or, or getting his expenses audited or whatever the latest lie there might be. Lying about taking £450,000 off, off Aaron Banks and then 24 hours later Aaron Banks comes out and says, no, it's true. It's different to that. It's standing at a press conference in front of the world's cameras as a truly and almost supremely powerful politician and claiming that the events happening on the other side of the door are not actually happening. 
And I, I, on some level, on a sort of existential or a philosophical level, I, I want to know why people aren't as shocked and as dismayed by that as I am. Because it's, it's the very definition of a democratic dismantling. How can anybody not be shocked by the president of America standing in front of the world's television cameras and telling provable lies about events not on the other side of the world, not 10 years ago, not false predictions or flawed predictions about events that may or may not happen 10 years or 10 minutes hence, telling provable, demonstrable lies about what's happening 100 yards away. I don't get it. If you wanted to give me a call and tell me why you don't mind, I, I, I'll, I'll do my best to stay civil, and I will, metaphorically speaking, bite your arm off. As we continue to cover both the visit to these islands of the American President Donald Trump and, of course, the reason, the reason for his visit, the 75th anniversary tomorrow of the D-Day landings, uh, 75 years ago today, of course, uh, some of the bravest men and women that history has ever seen were assembling on the south coast of this country in preparation for those invasions. Rachel Venables is in Portsmouth for LBC, where uh, well, the commemorations are underway. Rachel, what's the latest? Yes, so 75 years ago today, James, thousands of soldiers from 14 different countries were getting ready in places uh, like here, Portsmouth, other places like Southampton as well, to launch what would go on to be the biggest seaborne invasion in history. These men stormed five beaches in Normandy, Nazi-occupied France, and the battle that followed is seen as a key turning point in the Allies going on to win the Second World War. And so today, there is this huge commemoration event Planned. It's kicking off in just under an hour's time. You've got world leaders from those 14 countries and Germany's Chancellor Merkel as well will all be here on the seafront. You've got thousands of people, so just members of the public as well, turning up as well to honour those soldiers and around 300 veterans as well. And I've been speaking to some of them this morning and I want to um, bring you a little bit of what Art Boone had to tell me. Now, he was a gunner for the Canadian Army. He tells me he joined up, he voluntarily joined the army at the age of 15 after the second world war was declared and he was one of the many foreign soldiers who were shipped over to england to prepare for operation overlord there were seven thousand ships in the water and everybody's fired the air force is firing we're firing it went on from 7 30 in the morning to about 10 o'clock at night and then, then it, i began to think then you know I, I hope it's not like this every day <laughs> we would never survive and we didn't and no matter where we went after that, right up to the end of the war, I never seen a noisy day like D Day. It, it was different. Everything we had planned didn't work out either. So we had to keep improvising going along, you know. So even coming off the, off the landing craft, we were where we were supposed to go, we would have been knocked out, you know. So immediately you change that. And then we couldn't get off the beach, so we had to change the and we practiced for nine months, you know. But it doesn't matter how much you practice. It, it's The real thing is different. I always felt good about D-Day because what it was was freeing the French people. And we had an opportunity a couple of days later to talk to some of them, you know. And some of them, we had already knocked their houses out and everything. That didn't bother them any. They were free. And I always tell kids in that in school here, you complain about all the things they're taking away from you, but they take your freedom away from you. That's the biggest one. You know, the freedom to go to school or go to church, and that's it, your freedom. I never thought we'd ever be having a 75th anniversary, because on that morning, I didn't think we to have any anniversary. Well, now, this morning, veterans are starting to take their seats in front of a huge stage lined with flags here in Portsmouth. That's where an hour-long production is going to start soon. It'll tell the story of the invasion. That'll be played out to the crowd. So there'll be testimony as well from veterans, uh, theatrical performances as well, live music. And then there'll be a fly past of the Red Arrows and Spitfires. So you've got around 25 modern and historic planes taking to the skies and a royal gun salute as well from a Royal Navy ship, which will be out at See. Nobody does this sort of thing better than us. Rachel, when will we hear from you again? 
uh, whenever you want to, James. We're going to be reporting throughout the rest of the day here at Portsmouth, obviously speaking to many more veterans, uh, getting a, really a, a great sense of what's going on here because it is such a crucially poignant day. Obviously, the last two days it's all been about Donald Trump, the focus on him, but today the focus uh, is about D-Day and it's him and many other world leaders, of course, who are here all today, just really focused on, on the veterans, men like Art Boone, who you just heard from. Indeed, and uh, Angela Merkel present as well. Do we know, do, does everybody speak? How, how does that work? A number of world leaders will speak, so we've got 15 here. I don't think all of them will take to the stage, but certainly the ones whose countries that made the biggest contribution are expected to say something. We're expected to hear from Theresa May as well. She's going to call for a greater unity amongst Western countries, she, uh, you know, in, in the face of growing security threats. Another significant thing to point out about Theresa May, of course, is that this is going to be her uh, final uh, big public official appearance before official stepping down tomorrow, so a very uh, poignant moment for her as well, not just for D-Day, but I guess for that as well. Rachel Venables, many thanks indeed. We will indeed catch up with you uh, uh, before the end of this programme and throughout the day here on LBC. Again, it probably uh, would strike some people as wrong to point out. So so mad has everything become that, that Donald Trump himself, of course, dodged the draft at least five times, has insulted the war hero John McCain on countless occasions to such a degree that on his last visit to Japan last week, a decision was taken, and we'll never know who by, to, to cover up the USSS, USS John McCain for fear that it would upset the president, a man who was, who was held prisoner during, I think, the Vietnam War. Astonishing. I mean, just again, I could do every program at the moment on the question is how, how have we come so low? How have things gone so bonkers? Just asking the question, 03456060973. And, you know, there is some mileage in the claim that, that this is not about Donald Trump. This is about the fallen. It's about the, well, not just the fallen, the people who survived D-Day, uh, the, the fighters. But, of course, the first thing he did this morning, once he'd finished having an argument with Bette Midler on social media, do you know what Eisenhower did the day before D-Day? Wrote a letter, I think, to Churchill in which he explained that he would take full responsibility if D-Day failed. Just, just think about that. Dwight Eisenhower, full responsibility if D-Day were to fail. Like you can see it on my Twitter feed. It's quite hard to make out the, uh, the handwriting, but that is the import of the letter. <laughs> 75 years later, the president of America is having a spat with Bette Midler on social media while here to commemorate those that fought on D-Day that, that, that took part in those invasions. And also, as soon as he got out of bed this morning, or quite possibly still in it, I apologise for positing that mental image in your mind at uh, 42 minutes after 10 on a Wednesday morning, but he was also um, moaning about the media. You, you heard the veteran that Rachel spoke to talking about the importance of freedom. <laughs> That's what those people were fighting for. Freedom. Freedom of speech. Free media. And Trump, on a day... Today of all days decides it's time to start attacking the media again. Or um, I think Hitler employed the phrase Lurgan Presser, the lying press, which is, uh, I guess, a sort of 1930s German equivalent to the 21st century phrase fake news media. It's all there. If only people would care to join the dots. And part of today's programme, I suppose, is dedicated to asking why. Why people won't join the dots. Why people don't want to join the dots. Why we've, how we've ended up in a place in Britain in the 21st century, where the leader of the free world, to coin a phrase, can stand up in public and lie through his teeth about events that are unfolding 100 yards away. I just want to know how you think that has happened. And I do, again, issue an invitation to anybody who's comfortable with it. You, to people who don't, I don't mind. I like, perhaps you're not ready to say I like being lied to. But you might say, James, you're making far too much out of this. It doesn't matter that he's the most powerful man on the planet and he's lying in public about events unfolding before our very eyes, just a hundred yards away. It doesn't matter, James, because dot, dot, dot. Uh, it might be a big ask, though. 10.43 is the time. Daryl is in Bracknell. Daryl, what's going on? Hi, yeah, James. Um, all good. All good, James. Carry on. I was going to tell you, I was going to probably lie and say to you that I, I, I like Donald Trump, but I don't. I don't. <laughs> you won't believe me. I would I do. So, lots of people do. <laughs> I mean, there's, no, there's no shortage of people who do, but uh, yeah, maybe there's a shortage maybe. of them on my switchboard this morning. So how, mm. how, how have we ended up where we are, do you think? I, I, I just think that Donald Trump is, is very unique, um, clearly. Um, he's came... You know, he got the power and he's, he's had a lot of hangers on us. 
yes. if you like. Um, so he's always been allowed to control the narrative because money talks, doesn't it? And that's, that's I don't know. But money has simple. always talked, and, yeah, and yeah, possibly yeah, I'm yeah. being a bit naive, well, but yeah. I do think we're looking at something that we haven't seen before in our lifetimes. You know, Definitely you think not. it's the 75th anniversary of D-Day. You'd have to go back to before the Second World War to mm. see lies on this scale being told in yeah. this way by, by world leaders. Um, I, I just think that since the crash, people have been disillusioned. He's come in, he's pretended to be people's best friends, he's pretended to be, you know, somewhere way far, far, far away from the elite, yes. even though he is. <laughs> um, and, and people now, they, they, they have to double down. You know, you know those people would have to double down because they don't like to be wrong. Um, but it's and, not doubling. It's worse than doubling. It, he is, he's know, standing know, there in front of the cameras of the and even the BBC doesn't know how to play. Yeah. It's just you, it, you know what was funny as well is on. is um, who's the Labour MP who got who got canned in Peterborough? Pff, uh, Fiona. Um, the, 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 Fiona, yeah, Fiona. The driving she tried the same thing, didn't she? She tried the same thing with that video. I think you're right. She tried to lie through her teeth, and the, the first thing I thought of said is... Well, hang on, not I'm not, I'm not 100% au fait with that, but I think there was certainly some very violent wriggling. But is that really the same? Aren't you doing what a Trump supporter would do? You've got a, 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 a nondescript, non-entity MP, bang to rights, <laughs> out on her ear, wriggling on the end why of a hook, trying to get why off the... Why not try it? Why not try it? Why yeah, not you're try probably it? You right. Know. You're probably you right. Know. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something I'll regret now. <laughs> But I think part of the answer is probably that there are people in this profession, journalism, who are mm -hmm. also comfortable with lying. And that's why they don't perhaps call out liars in politics as roundly and as robustly as they should. Imagine if you had mm -hmm. edited a newspaper and printed lies, you'd probably be cool with Donald Trump, right? Because you'd think that that's how the game works. Yeah. It's just tactics. Yeah. It's the rough and tumble of, the yeah. of, of business. And, and maybe that makes me some sort of mewling snowflake in that... I'm sitting well, here going, I, don't, I, 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 I am indeed a mewling snowflake. I don't think the President of America should lie in public. Oh, all right, so he can lie in private then. They all lie. They always lie. At least Donald Trump is honest about his dishonesty. There, we got there in the end. That's the line, isn't it? That's the line. Why, why do you let him get away with it? Because at least he's honest about being dishonest. At least he'll say on Tuesday that the NHS is on the table and then on Wednesday that it isn't. He's not like all those other politicians... Who, who, who stick to the same line in public and then do things differently in secret. At least Donald Trump is honest about how dishonest he is. Fake news. Where we are trying to <laughs> sort of police the astonishing decline into deceit and dishonesty that Western politics has seen in the last few years without necessarily starting any fights. It's gone all right, I suppose. Um, but maybe we need a bit of a scrap, though, before 11. After 11, I'm minded at the moment to talk about health, um, again, in reference to Donald Trump's visit to these islands, but also recognising that clearly what many of us feared about the masterminds of Brexit, the, the billionaires whose names we probably don't know or um, aren't household names in the way that their puppets are, they've got their eye on the NHS. They, they have done for years. You only have to follow the um, uh, pronouncements from various, quotes, think tanks, end quotes, and, quotes, educational charities, end quotes, to see that there's a, there's a profound resentment in, in the upper orders of some parts of the country that, that they have to pay for poor people who get sick. Uh, the idea is if you can't afford to pay for yourself, then tough, suck it up. And if you think I'm exaggerating, take a guess how many families in America go bankrupt every year as a result of health care bills. Just take a guess. Uh, you probably won't even be close. I'll tell you after 11 just how many it is. But, but that is, I'm afraid, again, just a, a statement of fact. It's counting. It's not an opinion. The, the motivation for this kind of politics is, is uh, selfishness. Why the hell should I pay if your kid gets cancer? <laughs> I, I'm rich enough to cover it. I can pay my insurance premiums, or even I can pay for the treatment if I'm really, really rich. Why should I pay for your kid? You're just a bus driver. You know, you're only on 50 grand a year. Why the hell should I pay if your kid gets cancer? That's where it comes from. And there are people poised to make enormous profits. If, for example, you knew anyone, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but who had a background in insurance and also turned out to be bankrolling Brexit, it's not hard to work out why, is it? Well, apparently it is. But it occurred to me that I know very little about the American healthcare system and I know a lot more than I used to also about the British healthcare system. We're already close to two-tier here. And I, I wonder what happened, because in the 80s, Private health was a really big thing. 
a lot of people had it as a result of their contract. I think Dad had it as a result of his Daily Telegraph contact. I don't have private health insurance because I've never really needed it. But we've had a lot of dealings with the NHS over the last 18 months, more than anyone should have to. And you can see the two-tier creeping in. There are queues you can jump if you've got cash in your pocket, whether it's being paid for by your insurers or whether you're doing it on spec. And I read recently about a sort of A&E type service where you can pay 150 quid and go in and be seen more or less straight away if you've just, you know, fallen off your bike or broken your nose or something like that. It's not going to be much use for pre-existing conditions or, or, or serious, serious illnesses. But in terms of injuries, accidents and emergencies, you can pay a few quid jump ahead. There, there will be GP subscriptions. I'm reading Susan Hill's new novel. She's the, the woman that wrote The Woman in Black and her uh, Simon Seralia police novels are brilliant. I'm just coming to the end of her latest while I was on holiday. But that has a subplot about a, a, a GP concierge service where you pay 150 quid a month for your family and it means you have immediate access to a 24-7 GP service. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Unless something very, very big changes. And I, I think we're probably giving up on the hope that something very, very big is going to change in time to stop it from happening. Woody Johnson, the American ambassador, has been absolutely explicit about it being on their shopping list. I think Wilbur Ross, the, the American trade secretary, has, has also... He's either endorsed the idea that the NHS will be on the shopping list or rubbed his hands with glee at the prospect of coming over here and carving us up in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Donald Trump yesterday said that the NHS was on the shopping list. Today he said it isn't, of course, which is what he does. So I, I want in the... What I'd really like to do, at risk of it being a bit like one of those phonemes where I say, is there anybody old out there feeling poorly? I would, which, for the record, will ignite the switchboard like no other subject in history except perhaps parking tickets. I... I'm really interested in knowing what happens when you get ill in America because I just want to know. I think we all need to know a little bit more about what happens on the other side of the pond when you get ill. A friend of mine had insurance from her British university when she spent a year in America as part of her studies, fractured her wrist, had to pay $5,000 out of her own money for a sort of holding tactic for it to be put in. Um, bandaged up, strapped up, but not actually treated, not cured, or, or whatever the correct word is for a fractured ankle, fractured wrist. But her insurance paid for her to fly home early for free because that was better business for them than to pick up the medical bills that she would have run up in the event of being treated in an American hospital. And that was someone who had insurance on a sort of Medicaid or Obamacare-type level. So even when you've got that in America... The likelihood of receiving anything like what you would expect to receive here is zero. I just want to talk about it, um, hopefully with your help, because there should be enough people listening to this with enough experience for us to draw a rudimentary map of the American healthcare system. In the meantime, though, why, why, how have we ended up being a country where the President of the United States can stand next to our Prime Minister in front of the world's cameras and tell barefaced lies about what is happening a hundred yards away while he is speaking? Steve's in Aylesbury. Steve, what do you think? Hello, James. Hello, um, first of all, I think you need to do far less thinking on holiday. You do know what holiday's for, don't you? <laughs> My holidays are for thinking, so I come back refreshed <laughs> with slightly yeah, new I ways of saying slightly new ways of saying the same old thing, Steve. But thank you for your kids. It wasn't every minute of every day. I spent a lot of time thinking about souvlakis and various other Greek dishes. But but thank you. <laughs> nice one. Um, I suppose really to give you give you an idea as to where I'm coming from, I'm probably I listen to your show to learn about myself because I dislike so much of what you say. Yeah. Yes. And I think we can learn so much from our emotions um, that it's worth listening to it to see how I'm reacting. And then I learn about myself, which possibly sounds a little bit weird. No, um, I'm a swing voter. Um, I'm indifferent to Trump, but he serves a purpose. And I'll come back to you on that. And I think you hit the nail on the head earlier with some of the thinking that you did on holiday. On. My social conditioning, um, Margaret Thatcher and her arrival when the country was on its knees, that was probably the first time I paid a real interest in politics. And I saw how bad the country was. Um, the end of the Blair Brown government, I remember the no money left note in the Treasury, so I think back to that. Yes. Brexit, we've got the de uh, demos going on. The way I, I disagree with them, to be honest with you, at heart. Um, 
I, you know, I do question as to why they didn't. Some of these people didn't protest against China and Saudi Arabia. Um, momentum don't like them. Merkel. There, there, there were protests against China and a very big protest against Saudi extent. Arabia. That the answer they would give is yep. that China and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we never talk of the special relationship. They're not democracies. They're not supposed to uphold the values that we uphold. But there, there's, an, there's a, certainly an argument of hypocrisy there. But okay. you're also po boxing yourself, perhaps without realising it, into arguing that two wrongs make a right. I, I'd agree with that, but I think if you look at Brexit, if you look yeah. at Trump and all the rest of it, um, the immigration thing, I'm married to an Asian, but I do agree in a points-based system, and like, again, that's going to be down to social conditioning. I do think that on the, the, on the yeah. left side, there is a sort of denial. I'm thinking back to that MP who was sacked for talking about the grooming problem, and that, to me, was people living in denial, to be honest with you. Now, what I think is Trump... I'm indifferent to him. He does lie, but he stops the worst alternative and he frustrates the worst alternative. I'd include you in that. Okay. So it sounds a little bit childish, but I think people, they do need to step back and think, why do I feel the way that I do? A lot of it is social conditioning and it is a chance to kick the other side. And I think it is... But then we're back, we're back to football. Why are we on different yeah. sides? I, I, I would stick up for your wife when she was being attacked by racists. Well, so would I. Well, I know I you would. So why are we on? Me, why do you think we're on different sides then? Because of the way you've been socially, the way you've been brought up, the people you met, the people who've influenced you, etc. The same with me, you know. No, I, I'm I'm anti-racist, and you've got an so Asian. You've got an Asian wife. So what 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 are the two sides you're talking about? The left and the right, I would say. I mean. You, to me, with, I don't know what that means, really, because, you know, I'm, I'm probably more critical of Jeremy Corbyn at the moment than I am of anybody in the Conservative Party. So, What about it, the points-based system for immigration? To me, that's common sense. What's that to you? It, it, it can be common sense, but it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny in the context of the economic impact of immigration. And, and of course, we could already have introduced rules regarding what financial means and what work you had in place before we left the European Union. So that, that for me, is a red herring, but I don't mean that to... To yeah, be sure. dismissive, it just doesn't actually, un under proper scrutiny, make sense. And Australia has a points-based immigration, and people like your wife would be subjected to even more racism there than they could potentially be here. But I don't, I, 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 I understand why you use the word sides, and I, and I yeah. understand why you reach for left and right. Yeah. But, but I, I don't know, I don't know who, who you think is on the other side when it comes to sticking up for people like your wife. I, don't I think it's. What about that breaking point poster, which was supposed to make us frightened of people coming here from the Middle East, regardless of whether they had any right to be here or not? Which side were you on with that? With people coming to... I, I, I disagree with it. One of the things... Well, I with the poster? The, the government... The government Did I you disagree with the poster? Because the reason I despise that poster... Oh, I, dis I disagree with the poster, yeah. Okay, but you think you're on the other side to me? Um, I think that the government have got lots to answer for with immigration because what they did is, and I think Angela Merkel did this as well, she said, right, let's open the floodgates, but they did nothing to encourage integration. They, well, we've got a mayor of London here who's a Muslim. You phone me up to tell me that he, you're on the other side politically to me. Mm. You can't get much more integrated than being elected mayor of a country's capital city, and Donald Trump has chosen to attack him. So whose side are you on in that conversation? Well, I would say that the mayor of London should be concerned with the events of London. And so would I, but that's not what I asked. I asked who's, whose side are you on in that context? The, the fully integrated son of an immigrant or the racist American president? Um, I, I don't particularly like Sadiq Khan, and Donald Trump kicks him, so he suits my purpose. So you're on the side of the racist, against the um, Asian? No, I'm, I'm on the side of the guy who's against the other guy whose policies I disagree with. But no, I it's think nothing it's, to do with policies. We're talking about isn't. Donald Trump's I, personal attack on Sadiq Khan, uh, shortly after saying people should integrate more, and pointing out that Sadiq Khan's parents came here from overseas. You can't get much more integrated than being elected mayor. He's Asian. He's been the victim of attacks from Donald Trump that have never been inflicted upon a non-Asian. And vice versa. For, no, he's, he, he, Sadiq Khan has attacked Donald Trump for being far right, mate. And he is. I mean, that's, that's just a statement of record. He sympathises with the Ku Klux Klan. See, I, I think he that bans Muslims. Is your wife right? a Muslim or is she a, an Asian of a different religion? No, she's an, an Asian, actually, who gets a hard time from the Muslims. I don't want to go into the details. No, fine. But, but that's, that's, that, what side are you on? The, the side of the Asian or the side of the man attacking the Asian? Um, I'm on the side of I'm, I'm on the side of the guy who's frustrating the guy whose policy side. Yeah, disagree so you with. don't you don't care whether he's fouling or not. You're just glad that the other bloke's getting hurt. Do you know what? I think it's got down to as basic as that. James, I, I do. I, I can't believe your honesty. 
but you're not okay. you're not in any way embarrassed by it. Um, uh, it's it's just the way we are as people. So he's a mass, he's a liar, he's a liar and a racist, but he's hurting Sadiq Khan. So I like him. I think he's I, what I you said. Sadiq Khan, contrary to what Donald Trump says, is big and bad enough to be able to take. That's that not the on, point, on though. The I just want to be clear that I've understood you correctly. Donald Trump is a liar and he's a racist and he he, he stokes up the sort of feelings that could see your wife being victimised. But you're on his side because he's hurting Sadiq Khan, who you don't like for whatever reason. If Donald Trump fr frustrates what I believe yeah. to be the detriment of our society, yes. And the detriment of our society is people not integrating, which is why, you don't, which is why you don't like Sadiq Khan, who got himself elected mayor of our capital city. S Sadiq Khan is Labour, and he doesn't understand basic economics. Looking at the performance of well, Labour government over you're the jumping year, around it would again. be disastrous. You're jumping around again, aren't you? Cause, cause, not really. Well, you are, because we're talking about... The things, the words that you've said. Why do you like Donald Trump in the context of a battle no, with Sadiq? I didn't Sadiq? say I like Donald Trump. All right, but you talked about sides. Yeah, but you talked about sides. Yeah, I do. And I think that's what it's come down no, to. No, I think we you're right. Talk, I, we can I, talk about policies. No, I think, well, we can't talk about policies in a conversation about Donald Trump versus Sadiq Khan because D Donald Trump's impact upon. And also, Sadiq Khan has incredibly limited powers over the economic scenarios See, in this thing, city but I, I may, I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm a gog no, with admiration no, no, no. for you admiration is not quite the right word gratitude because I you were the holy grail caller I was looking for and your honesty is really really refreshing but it scares the hell out of me I would like to talk about health care and what happens in America when you get poorly it might seem like an odd question but it's actually a really important one given that uh, yeah, there is a broad belief that health care is something that uh, wealthy investors on both sides of the Atlantic have long had their eye on. Uh, I, I, mean, I politicise it. I think it's the most political thing in Britain, the NHS, actually. It's also the closest thing to a socialist institution that this country has ever seen, with, ah, with the possible exception of the welfare state. But if you get sick now, uh, the NHS is being um, uh, eaten from the inside out, ev everywhere from GP surgeries to A&E, suffering from underfunding and, and austerity policies but still being kept afloat by brilliant and dedicated professionals from all over the world. Um, that's something else, of course, that's under threat in the current political climate. You, 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 know, you know that someone will try to help you if you need help. You may not get the help you need or the help that you want, or you may not get as much help as you think you deserve, but you know that someone will try to help you, and you know you won't get given a bill at the end of it. I don't know enough about America. I've spent very little time in America. I've never lived there. I've never worked there. I just want to know what happens when you get sick in America. And whether or not the, the kind of lazy, perhaps, posturing that somebody like I might undertake and saying, oh, it's all bad, it's all awful. Um, over half a million families every year go bankrupt as a result of medical bills. Maybe that's not as terrifying a statistic as I think it is. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. But one or two more calls first on how we've ended up in a place where... Thousands of people can be protesting against Donald Trump's presence and uh, just a couple of hundred yards away, he can stand up in front of the world's cameras and say, no, they're not. That just intrigues me. Um, and I thought Steve's answer was brilliant, heartbreakingly brilliant, but brilliant. I don't really care, James, because I see him as being on my side. Well, who's on the other side? People like Sadiq Khan. Why? How, how has that happened? Perhaps is a conversation for a different day. Or, of course, it's a question I try to answer in my book, which is now out in paperback, and I've got until the second hour of my first day back since its launch without mentioning it, which deserves at least a pat on the back. So while we're in plugging mode, I should also invite you to the Shaw Theatre a week tonight if you want to come and see me in conversation with Danny Wallace, um, which I'm really looking forward to because Danny Wallace is, is just a legend and one of the most interesting people. His career, he's had about five different careers, but anyway, he'll be asking the questions sadly, so you won't find out much about him, but you can find out more than you could ever hope to know about me. And if you want to get tickets for that, you can, you can find a link at the top of my Twitter feed. It's my pinned tweet at the moment, at Mr. James O.B. So back, back to the lies, um, uh, unchallenged, uh, utterly uh, undisputed as well. That's the astonishing thing. Uh, everybody knows that there were thousands of people protesting against him, but Donald Trump denied it. And I just want to know how you think he gets away with it, or we've ended up in a place where, where this happens. 11-11 is the time. Alex is in Cardiff. Alex, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier um, objective truth, and I thought that kind of comment resonated with me somewhat. Um, but I think there's a lot of projection taking place, James, if you don't mind me saying so, from a lot of the broadcast media. 
Um, what do, what do you mean? What do you mean by that, mate? Well, in terms of this selective outrage that seems to take place, I mean, for anyone who does to care to research for themselves, I mean, there wouldn't be this outrage or hundreds of, or thousands of people protesting had Clinton won, would they? I mean, there's footage of Clinton on uh, talking about Gaddafi sitting back and laughing upon but, his... But what, um, why is this, proje- killed, saying, why is this know, projection? Saying, because there's a selective outrage and a magnifying glass is placed on absolutely everything Trump says or does. Well, as huge, huge, awful um, crimes and uh, legal invasions, for example, war crimes are seemingly just brushed under the carpet. But how do you know Clinton's about them, on, then? Because, well, Clinton's on YouTube laughing about killing Gaddafi. On, on, saying, on camera? We came, we, yes, on camera. Yes, saying, so it's not came, being brushed under we, the carpet, is it? We came, we it's saw... being recorded and broadcast. Yeah, but it's not broadcast. So the question, the question the today is, how can Donald Trump stand up in public and lie about things that are happening 200 yards away? Um, he actually acknowledged that there were some protests. You made a claim that there were tens of thousands of people there. The, the, the early the estimate from police is 10,000. Organisers where say, say 75,000. So let's can just say have, a 10,000 then. Just around the corner from Downing Street, tens of thousands listen to the Labour leader. Tens of thousands listen to the Labour leader. Okay, where's or your thousands, source for that? Where's or thousands. Where, how, the police. Can you, can An you early estimate from police officers. Well, we had journalists, sir. There were crowds of people there. They were in the crowd Cheers. with their microphones. Matthew Thompson filled that scumbag throwing a milkshake at one of the few right, people I, that was I, there well, exactly. to I, applaud the Donald Trump. So there were okay, thousands the of... I don't know what you think you're arguing about. Are you saying there um, weren't thousands of people there? The, he acknowledged there were well, thousands Well, let's listen to what he said then. Okay. Even coming over today, there were thousands of people cheering... And then I heard that there were protests. I said, where are the protests? I don't see any protests. I did see a small protest today when I came, very small. So a lot of it is fake news, I hate to say. But you saw the, the people waving the American flag, waving your flag. It was tremendous spirit and love. His motorcade then took him off towards Westminster. He later spoke of seeing thousands of well-wishers. The mall, though, looked empty except for police. Many roads shut down for his convoy. Most protesters kept well away. As he turned into Downing Street, one supporter waved to stars and stripes. There was great love. It was an alliance. And I didn't see the protesters until just a little while ago, and it was a very, very small group of people put in for political reasons. So it was fake news. Thank you. OK, so, I mean, we both know that's nonsense, right? Well, he, he acknowledged he saw a small group. But he also said he didn't. He said, I didn't see any protest. Actually, no, he, I did see a small group. He acknowledged I protest. saw a small group. And the That's thousands an of people who were cheering, Where's Alex? The, the thousands well, of people that were cheering? Maybe we don't see them on our media with a clear agenda, agenda against okay. Trump. And, and I, I respect that. Uh, you, you, they were there, but they go to a different school. It's coming up to quarter past 11, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we will do our best to bring you events, news and occurrences as they happen. But obviously, I have no power over the agenda that deliberately... Um, covers up the cameras that recorded all the thousands of people cheering for Donald Trump. If you follow Alex on YouTube, no doubt he has the footage that you need to have a clearer picture of the fact that there was a tiny little protest against him, put there for political reasons, but thousands of people cheering for him with American flags. Unfortunately, every camera present in Trafalgar Square was at that point facing in the wrong direction.